Hi, I'm Billy Boyd. And I'm Dominic Monaghan. I'm Elijah Wood. I'm Sean Astin. Hello, my name's Andy Serkis. And this is Gollum. And this is Smithel. And welcome to the cast commentary for The Return of the King. That's the third movie in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Kind of an interesting thing to let people know is that the first time that we see the extended cut is now. Now. <laughs> it's at this moment, you're watching with us. Well, I'm looking forward to doing a little stream of consciousness sharing with the hundreds of millions of Lord of the Rings fans who go out and get these DVDs. So let's, you want to dig in? Let's do it. This is the opening shot to Return of the King, and as you can see, involves a worm. The most difficult thing about this shot was getting the worm on the hook, because as you can see, when it comes into shot, it's an enormous hook and a very small worm, but no worms were killed or maimed during the making of that shot. Now then, Thomas Robbins, who played Deagle, and myself, who played Smeagol, uh, shot this scene in Fernside, north of Wellington. What this scene was really trying to achieve was a sense of taking you back to the Shire, taking you back to a golden time before the ring ruins all of these people's lives. Smeagol! Smeagol here is, is enjoying Deagle's inability to fish. He quite likes seeing other people having a bad time of things, but he's not malicious. It was very important for me to establish him as, as a hobbit, as someone who was capable of being normal before this tragedy happens to him. Smeagol really enjoyed seeing his cousin fall into the water. <laughs> yes, the die was coming soon. Precious, wasn't I? Yes, 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 you won't be caught yet. Tell you what, that's a strong fish to pull that hobbit under the water and... Drag him for a bit. Yeah. He's just had a big bite of a donut, hasn't he? What's that, though? I don't know. What is that? Is that his keys? Did he lose his keys? And I think this scene was filmed, was it not, Dom? Hmm. To be in the two towers. I agree with you there, Billy. The sequence was originally meant to be in the two towers in the Dead Marshes when Frodo says, you used to be a hobbit once, you used to be called Smeagol, and, and then he remembers his name for the first time. But Peter and Fran thought very cleverly, hold back from delivering the origins of the character, allow the audience to live with that character and the mystery of the character over a year before the release of the next film, and, and keep it like a psychological thriller. Placing it at the beginning of the third film, it, it really does take you back to life before the ring, and so for the arc of the third film, it works terrifically well. <laughs> this was the most difficult part of the scene, is knowing exactly how to play, and we played it in a whole spectrum of ways, knowing exactly how to play the moment of seeing the ring and becoming addicted to it immediately. As Tolkien writes, the ring affects you according to your moral stature, so we had to make that very apparent, but at the same time, not melodramatic, and it had to be real. So the whole idea of the two characters, it could have gone either way. The whole idea that, you know, it was affecting Deagle as well, it gives power to the ring and actually makes it less one-sided. It could happen to any of us. It's my birthday. It's good we get to see Andy Serkis, isn't it? Yeah, because I think, like most of the audience know, he did do so much work to play Gollum, but was obviously not seen in his fine male form. And now we do see him. Now we see him. I remember sitting and watching the movie for the first time and sitting between my wife and Andy Serkis, and when this came on, he was just beaming. And I just felt like this man, who at that point had existed for years with these movies, as the movies became successful, people still didn't understand, still didn't realize how much time and energy he put into creating the character of Gollum. The one thing about Andy as well, he's, he's one of these actors that goes for it 100%. So I wouldn't really like to be Deagle. Yeah, he probably is trying to kill this guy. Yeah, he probably did kill him, actually. Yeah. Thomas's neck was red raw by the end of shooting. He really had to put up with quite a lot. Oh, this is an extra bit here. This is more choking to show that he really did choke him. Yeah, that he's really being choked. I think this is the purest example of what the ring can do, because you see him as this innocent hobbit. You see what it does to him upon seeing it, and ultimately how it physically changes him as well. Fran Walsh, who was directing this sequence, got very ill, and I, I got a call from Peter about 6 o'clock in the morning, and he asked me if I'd direct some of the sequence. So I, I talked to uh, Thomas about it, and we worked out this relationship between us. And then I'd run with the shots once we'd come up with some stuff and we'd run across with a clamshell, which is a little video TV monitor, and I'd take that and show Pete and then come back and we'd shoot some more. Wow. Precious. We played this shot in a myriad of different ways to try and really nail the truest response to that moment of ecstasy. And then, of course, it's like the fall from grace. Christus. 
This series of vignettes, we wanted to create an image of the descent into madness, the obsession, the addiction growing, and that shot of being hunched over by the tree. It's almost like he's suffering from heroin addiction. This, he's really becoming absorbed by the drug. Saying the name for the first time, finding that convulsion, finding that inability to, to stop this way of talking coming out of his mouth. You know, he's called Gollum because of the way he sounds, so this really shows that. It's good this part for Andy because he was able to use his real teeth and his real nails for this. He does actually have grotesque teeth. Most English men do. Scotsmen, on the other hand, have textbook teeth. Yeah, we use them for biting haggis mm. and also for helping to chew the ends off our kilt. That moment where he's glaring round was it's him becoming more paranoid of people watching him. And this is the last that he ever sees of sunlight, the last time he looks up and, and sees the yellow face, the sunshine, before he disappears into the Misty Mountains. This looks like kind of a full-body prosthetic. Yeah. Which would be a nightmare. A lot of work. The prosthetics for this particular shot, we started off at 3.30 in the morning, I think I was on set. Just there, you'll see the final moment of prosthetic makeup before it becomes digital Gollum. It's amazing how, how much Gollum ended up looking like Andy. Hence the, the complete redesign of the face, because, of course, we shot a lot of that in principal photography, and Gollum hadn't been fully facially designed at that point. So it was going backwards and sort of saying, well, that's how Andy's face looks. Let's build Gollum's face to fit that. So all the facial structure had, from then on was redesigned, so that's why you'll see a qualitative difference from Fellowship into Two Towers. I think that first shot, wasn't it snowing that day? It was, yeah. It was like so bone-chillingly cold that day. You can't even tell. It was frighteningly cold that day. Now we see Frodo with the ring, you see, and we think, well, he could end up like that. Yeah. You know, eating raw fish. Getting all skinny. It's probably why he keeps Gollum alive and feels sorry for him so much, is that he sees so much of himself potentially in Gollum. Yes, yes, and here we are, aren't we fresh and yes. This culvert, that bit there is still on location. Is it? Yeah. Because you it's look not, younger. It's not until they turn it around where you can't actually see the background and you only see the culvert. That's I just not know location. that throughout the years, mm. in different places in New Zealand, we'd arrive at sets and you'd see the cement structure of the culvert sort of parked out in the parking lot. And you kind of knew, like, it was the cover set. It was just like, waiting. when something goes wrong, yeah, and you sort of think, God, we're going to have to go back <laughs> into the culvert, back to the culvert. Oh, man. I never really understood that whole earthquake thing until I saw it in the, <laughs> the context of the film. <laughs> when we were doing it on the day, I'm like, it's, the earth is shaking? This is like a Star Trek moment. What's happening? I thought a little better about it when they were when they were physically shaking the camera, when you could see them yeah. sort of wiggling the camera. Then you sort of felt like, I'm not going to look like too big of an idiot. No. <laughs> but honestly, I didn't fully understand it, which is weird, but I didn't fully understand it until I saw the film. I'm just happy that it's been long enough from the first movie that when we talk about Lembus bread, that it's not as horrifying to you and me as... Because no. that one scene at the beginning oh, wow. of the two towers. Lamb. <laughs> Lamb was oh, bread. Oh, <laughs> lordy, Lou. All right. I actually really enjoyed the Lembus bread. I don't know if... The taste of it. Yeah. There was something kind of sweet about it. Mm. Sort of short bready without being short bread. I remember having to do food acting. You know, you eat and then you, you sort of talk and like, do you, do you swallow or... I think there is a moment in the film where I have a bit in my mouth and I'm kind of talking through... The journey of... It was actually in the culvert. It was when we did the, the pickups some three years later. I'm supposed to be eating and talking with food in my mouth. I think there's a couple of takes where I had way too much. I got a little bit of a talking to from Fran. Less food. <laughs> Better acting, less food. <laughs> okay, Fran. Now, where are they here, Bill? What do you think, South Island? Well, let's have a look. I can't make this out. Head right. in a tail. I believe it was in Whiteray Forest, north of Macra, just north of Wellington. Here come the heroes. That's a studio. Yeah, this is a studio. What a fantastic studio. Thank you. Well, this is the Fangorn Forest. Never existed in reality. There was a few trees dotted around a set outside the main studios in Wellington. Who's that? Oh, he's very beautiful. He's beautiful, but darker. Yeah. He's more scary beautiful. More I'll hit you in the face beautiful. Yeah. It's amazing how they piece this together. Little bursts of 15 second riding all pieced together to make it look like we're going through a big forest. The Return of the King, originally called The Return of Merry. That's us, that. Yeah, we're laughing, eh? Yeah, we're laughing. 
This was a good fun scene to do, wasn't it? Yeah, we filmed it in a couple of different ways, didn't we? One was drunk, and one was a little bit stoned, a little bit affected by the pipe weed. Yeah. And then one which was kind of neither. Yeah. What do you think Pete went for? Drunkish? Kind of drunkish, I think. Yeah. What was amazing during the whole filming process was that mainly because Billy and Dom, who you see in here playing Merry and Pippin, because they were thrown together in, as English actors, they formed this incredible bond. And I think it shows in their work. And I think the writing, as it went on, reflected their friendship and their ability to stay completely in sync with each other. Showing, once again, hobbits, regardless of what's gone on before or what will happen after, if they have a beer in the hand, some pipe weed and some food, they just have fun, enjoy it. There was some question at this moment, how many hobbits had I seen? Was I aware of the fact that there were hobbits in existence in Middle Earth? And I think we came to the conclusion that I probably did have some kind of knowledge of them, but probably not much experience. You never actually see my reaction to it, but at the time we shot some stuff of uh, my reaction to the hobbits, which was one of kind of bemused detachment, I suppose. This was filmed out in uh, Lower Hutt, I believe. Quite a unique set, actually. It was a tank, which was only about a foot high. Like a huge swimming pool, you know, like a big swimming pool in the backyard. It was incredibly manky by the end of it. I'm glad we were on horseback. A lot of time I had to be on my knees in this swimming pool with all these horses and stuff in it. And they were all shitting into this pool. I wasn't thinking about this, Dom. Oh. I had to plunge myself into it. It wasn't nice. Well, let's just have it. I didn't see Isengard or have a sense of its scale until I saw the completed film. So when I was shouting up to Christopher, he was in another car park standing on a platform and we could hear each other shouting against the New Zealand wind. I had no idea that he was meant to be, I don't know, what, half a mile up? But what do the actors know? One of the saddest things about um, the edit for the film, the theatrical version, was that Christopher lost his place in the film. And it would have been rather churlish of me to, to put my side forward because this is actually my best scene in the whole trilogy or in the two films that I'm in in the trilogy. So that was a bit of a loss anyway. I think it's a loss for, for, for Saruman's character and for Theoden's character. Christopher's said several times, one of the reasons why he, he adores this scene is it's pure Tolkien. It's one of the purest scenes. We shall have peace. It's a very complex character, superbly written by Tolkien. And he never explains, as far as I can recall, what makes Saruman change. He, he goes through all the emotions, you might say, that are already there in Tolkien's character. The feeling of power, the actual power, the hypnotic effect of his being and his voice and what he says, plus the hatred and anger and fury when something doesn't quite go the way he wants it to. So you have come here for information? Oh, you want information, do you? I can give you some going to die. That, of course, is vicious and sarcastic, black humour. He's got the bowling ball. I won the West County Championship Crown Green Bowling. Even now, he, <laughs> he can still exert this kind of power which makes them uneasy. So part of it is gentle and quiet. Part of it is savage and harsh. Part of it is almost snarling. Part of it is total sarcasm, contempt. And part of it is, I know things you don't know, things you have failed to see. Great character, because he's, you know, he's trying to get inside our heads, trying to play with our minds, make us all be suspicious of each other and, and doubt each other. But we can't, we love each other, we're a fellowship. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'll never doubt you, Bill. No. What words of comfort did you give the halfling? I think I'm right in saying there was a blue sky, but it was windy, but they also had a wind machine. Well, of course, that looked wonderful in terms of blowing my robes around. It doesn't look so fabulous when my beard covers my face. And it gave rise to a great deal of unnecessary laughter, in my opinion, starting with the director, who thought it was hilariously funny that I was trying to say these superb Tolkien lines through a mass of hair which covered the whole of my face, the wig on the top and the beard over here. But we managed to 
get around it by doing something indoors eventually. But they do use some of the exterior shots that were shot in the parking lot. Oh, Brad Dourif. I missed Brad in this film as well. Yeah. I love Brad Dourif. The only time you see Grima is when he's in this deteriorated state, I suppose, like you find Thaden at the beginning, in his state, but then Thaden gets a resurrection and Grima doesn't. You were once a man of Rohan. See, there you are. He was once a man of Rohan. There's an awful lot revealed here, a lot of the story that you don't actually see in the movie, but you suspect, and it's hinted at, like the poison of Thaden and Wormtongue's part in the whole thing. And at the end, you see Thaden show a great level of kingship, if you like, magnanimity, and forgiving Grima, because he realizes that, and it's something that I've said quite a lot in the analysis of, of the two films I'm involved in, there is a sense that Grima is as much a victim as anybody of the whole evil process that is embodied via Sauron into Saruman. I remember Brad Dourif saying, you made me do it. He actually said that when we shot it. All these things, in other words, that you see pouring poison into King Theoden's ear is all my idea, and he's done it. I made him do it. I got really good with a bow and arrow, funnily enough. I mean, obviously, most of it was done without. They added the arrows in later, but I think that shot I did actually do with an arrow. And they put up a cross, and I was hitting the cross, and the guy who was training me had all these big plastic things that I was shooting at, bears and deers, and as if I was going hunting. It was great. Good stuff, that, Bill. Oh, yeah. Now, there was a lot of controversy in New Zealand over this shot of Saruman kind of stuck between the spokes of a, what, what is it, big wheel? because the New Zealand press got hold of it somehow and everybody thought that it was Gandalf and everybody thought that Gandalf was killed in the movie and it obviously, it's not how it works in the book. Pete was quite annoyed about that, wasn't he? Yeah. That it got out. Someone had taken a photo on the set. Well, there was people everywhere with um, long lenses and stuff as well, wasn't there? And then cameras were banned. Yeah. Well, that's how the Palantir gets down there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> The great truth, of course, of Treebeard's line, you know, trees will grow again. This is what all of us who are environmentally conscious forget about nature, that by and large, anything that we do, nature will put things right given time. The earth will continue for a lot longer than men will. This is me wading through horse. Say poo. Poo. Yeah, good. Because there's kids watching yeah. and listening. In fact, I remember one time I went down to get the Palantir and actually picked up a horse's poo. Yeah. And because I was so in the moment, I actually handed a poo to Ian McKellen here. And he wrapped up in his shawl. And then struck me violently about the face, head and neck. Look at that face, you go, oh, you know what? Well, I'll, well, I'll have that again, I will. See, I'm taken by it, Dom. I'm taken by it. Yeah, I'm not, though. Interestingly no. enough, I'm not, I'm well, not bothered. You haven't touched it, that's the thing. Mm. You know, once you've seen it, you think, oof, I'll have another look at that. So we finally get to use this shot that was used so much in the trailers, I think, for the second movie, but I don't think it was actually ever in the second movie. It was originally a shot about me watching them ride away to battle later on in the third film, but in the end I ended up leaving with them, so um, I couldn't watch them right away. That's a little confusing, but um, I was confused too. The geography very, got very confusing when we were shooting the third movie. I was always disappointed with that windy shot of Miranda that her dress didn't fly right up and you saw her knickers and stuff. Well, she didn't wear any, Tom. Uh -huh. That's why they couldn't show her. Hail the victorious dead! Hail! Beagle just pauses there because he thinks, I've not had a drink since Easter Sunday, I don't know if I should break this. And this was the scene that Peter put in uh, after the Battle of Helm's Deep to commemorate the loss of life, which then abruptly devolves into a... Uh, Massive piss up. <laughs> it's a drinking. Pete just said we want to just lighten up the mood a bit, so we're going to have the hobbits dancing on the table, singing their song. We want Legolas and Gimli to have this drinking game. He's having a good smell of it. Yeah, elves have a very strong sense of smell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, it was actually uh, Legolas who told me that it was actually a horse poo and not the Palantir. Oh really? Mm. We like the idea of um, using Eowyn with the chalice or, or the cup, because that's sort of an image that Alan Lee used in one of his drawings, where she presents the cup to Aragorn. And then we thought we'd use it also, giving it to Theoden as, as he is king. 
She likes him. He likes her. He likes someone else. That person likes him. He's got the best of both worlds. Yeah. That's a great position to be in as a man. Two girls like you and you think, who do I like more? Do I go blackhead? Do I go strawberry bun? But no knickers. Oh, that's a good point. See, she's one with that. But Liv Tyler has nice, nice lips and beautiful skin. When we were writing in the, the development, the stages of, of Theoden, one of the things that I was quite insistent upon was it shouldn't be a consistent development, that you should actually have little falls. And, and one of them is here, where you see kind of the self-doubt creep back in just ever so slightly, in confidence with his niece, obviously, but this idea that he didn't do it all on his own. <laughs> He's cheating, actually, because it's all going in his beard, you know that? That's what dwarves do. This was um, Aimer's attempt <laughs> to get Legolas hammered. It's really supposed to, part of it's supposed to trigger back to the um, initial animosity felt between Legolas and Aimer, which you saw in the two towers. When uh, Legolas pulls a bow on Aimer, by the end of Helm's Deep, really, they're, they're good buddies, in the book anyway. I think what they probably gave me to drink was something like one of those alcohol-free beers. Or it may have been something like uh, apple juice from Coke or something like that. Something fairly disgusting, you know, you get the old froth going. Yeah, it's a complete role reversal because a couple of drinks, Orlando's, anyone's. <laughs> totally. I'm a, such a lightweight. Here this, we go, though. This was reshoots. Oh! Yep. Hey! There was no one there, just me and Dom. Yeah. We choreographed that little dance as well. Me and Dom did. Choreographer, stroke dancer. It's on my CV. Wasn't sure if that reaction shot was in the full length. It wasn't. You I'll are sure. That, I'll tell you that for sure. Because I like that. I think it builds up his guilt of not only did he pick up the palantir, which he knows that he shouldn't have done, but it's also kind of grown in his mind that he really, really wants to have another look at it. Mm. And also that Gandalf has a kind of inkling that he knows he's going to do it as well. Nothing. When it comes to Gandalf in the third film, Peter said that he and Fran and Philippa definitely wanted to, to, to flesh out uh, Gandalf's emotional journey, which they thought was going to be a, um, an important strand in keeping the audience's attention and enthusiasm going right through to the bitter end. But Frodo is alive. So although Gandalf doesn't have much to do yes. with uh, Frodo, and that they don't share scenes, really. Uh, he's constantly thinking about him. This shot that you're seeing now was shot on a set, but from here on in, in the close-ups, was all done in the motion capture studio. It was at this point that we realised that we could either stay with what we'd created in, in Two Towers, i.e. the two characterisations, Smeagol being the innocent character and Gollum being the revengeful one, or, or we could actually take the audience on a slightly more uncomfortable, difficult and challenging journey by making Smeagol, at the end of the day, the more dark of the two. He is childish, but then he's manipulative, and as anyone knows who's got children, they can be manipulative. But this really is where you get to see Smeagol becoming slightly more self-obsessed, slightly more wanting his own thing at the expense of Gollum. Gollum is just reacting viscerally. It's a gut reaction. He's hot-blooded. He's angry. But Smeagol, he's cold-blooded and calculating. The flashback was... Gollum trying to gain control, reminding Smeagol, making him feel guilty for the fact that he did kill Deagle for the ring and that he can do it again. He's got to gather himself together and stick to the plan. This whole sequence was shot as a one-take scene again, as we did with Two Towers. It's a wonderful scene. I think that that, that scene in the, in the Two Towers that is such a, a favourite of fans from what I've... Schizophrenia scene. That schizophrenia scene. And now to have another one, yet so different. And just the confidence. I actually think I prefer uh, this particular one because he actually has a reflection of himself to look at. I didn't ever want it to feel like there were two characters. It was all coming out of one head. It was just different parts of his personality rearing up at different times as he's arguing it out with himself. So I played, I played the entire sequence through as one. I remember we we're, were laying over there on the side when they were shooting some of these things. Sleeping? Sometimes. Sleeping, yeah, and actually literally falling literally asleep on the falling cold asleep. studio floor. Yep. 
So Gollum becomes the kind of the orchestrator, the one who's holding Smeagol together, and, and it's like Smeagol becomes the doer through using his own manipulative wiles. He forgets himself. Smeagol forgets himself, forgets his naive personality for a minute and, and reveals to Gollum how selfish he is. I always think of him as someone who, uh, who you work with, who you think has got particularly nasty habits, who's, you know, you don't really like, he's a bit creepy in the office, and then they'll do something one day that perhaps he breaks your heart, and, and then you'll think, oh, how have I misunderstood this person? And then they'll do something the next day that you just want to, you want to kill him, you know? So that's, that's really how I began to think of Gollum, as someone that... I mean, you laugh with him, you, you, you despise him you, all the time, and I think this is why I've, I keep talking about the writing, really. I think Fran Walsh, who really wrote most of the Gollum scenes on her own, I just think she just did an incredible job on, uh, on shaping that. I really enjoy this, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Over the top. <laughs> That's him overacting again. No, I wasn't. Yes, you were, precious. I, I remember how badly of writing you were that day. Shut up! Can't do this by ourselves, Seth. No, this, was a, this was a pickup scene, wasn't it? I need you on my side. I need you on my side. That was added, which side. I really enjoyed. I think to maintain that connection, especially since it's going to be broken I later, I think is really important. Trust me. And just coming up, you'll see, really, for the first time, Gollum showing to Sam that he means business with that look and that Sam can't do anything about it. Just sleeping it off, Gimli. I've been asked to talk about dwarvish farts. Of course, it is not true that dwarves ever fart. Elves, on the other hand, it's a little-known fact that <clears throat> they snore and fart all the time. <laughs> it's disgusting. Oh, this is uh, a new scene. Vigo and Miranda. Where's Miranda? She's asleep. Is oh, she? Yeah. Ah. I'm really glad this scene's back in the extended DVD. I knew that it would go from the movie because it's not its not imperative to the narrative of the film. Showing the tenderness. Keep the fire warm. Yeah, you just, you just pull it over her toes because if you leave your extremities out for any more than 35 minutes, you'll, you'll have a nightmare. What time is it? The dream that she speaks about is actually in the book. It's Faramir's, but it, it's such a an interesting dream, I think, that she has, and it's sort of the sense of foreboding of what's about to happen. I dreamed I saw a great wave. I guess I, I like it, because it's that. it's not just about her being in love with him, it, it's about them both being at this point of not knowing whether they will live or die or, or what will happen to everybody around them, and, yeah, it's just a, a sense of fear of how you're going to be in the future, how, how you're going to react, are you going to be able to act, or, or will you be... Paralyzed, which is sort of her fear. That's a lovely scene. That was a nice scene to shoot too. Originally, I think they were going to put me in a chair, and Nyla went, "No, no, no, no. She can't sleep in a chair. She has to have a proper chaise lounge or something to to sit on, so that we can drape the robes properly to make it that kind of image." But there's something so nice and quiet, something quiet and personal between them. He's just scoping around, seeing if there's anything to do tonight. Any bars open? He's thinking, look, if I was in Hidalgo, I'd race through this desert. <laughs> I remember looking out over these plains and Aragorn comes up to me and I remember just looking out there and it was so vast and it made me feel so small, scanning the horizon and it kind of really lent itself. It was amazing. You're about to see me go and have another look at the Palantir. Not before Orlando finishes off his Red Riding Hood impression, though. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I'm used to those hobbits taking the mickey out of me. Young Peregrine Took. Wonderful talent. Here's Pip up to no good. The idea that Gandalf sleeps with his eyes open is a wonderful concept. Like Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood sleeps with his eyes open. Elijah Wood sleeps with his eyes open. They're not, like, wide open. They're just open just enough where you can see that you're in REM state. Where and... it's slightly creepy? Yeah. It's kind of like Gandalf right there. Do you know what I did here, Dom? What? I said to Pete, you know what I'd love to do? What? I'd love to do the, what do you call it, the Harrison Ford thing. Oh, Indiana Jones. Yeah. So I said, why don't I get the jug and put the jug there? And he said, oh, you can't because it's the wrong scale. It's not Hobbit scale. And then 
this guy from the back went, ah, actually, we have it made in Hobbit scale as well. That's great, isn't How it? great is that? There was never anything in the script or us talking to anyone that we were going to use that or that anyone was going to lift it up. Right. But they had made it in two scales, just in case. Great. Yeah. Shows the dedication there. We actually filmed the other side of this, where I am inside the Palantir. But when they watched the back, I think they thought it was too kind of sci-fi. Right. And it made it something else. So what did it look like? It was all I never, I've clouds. never really seen it, but I, I think it was supposed to be all flames and right. just me standing in the middle of all these flames. It's really hard as an actor to stop at something where you, you have to have something passing through you. It's very difficult. I think Billy Boyd handles this really well. Beautiful. I mean, you really believe that thing's starting to take him over and he can't take his hands off it. See, now at that point, he gets to have a little glimpse at Aragorn. Yeah. And it's all solved very simply by just throwing your cloak over it. This is you, you're going to help me, you see. And then Gandalf just pushes me out of the way. Good out of it. Oh! Good that. Once again with Pete. He keeps showing every so often that we're small, but it's not a big issue. Just then he was able to cut away, show a little shot of a smaller guy falling down, and then back to the real Billy. Who would have been fun? Yeah. There's the hands here, tall Paul, not Ian McKellen, because Ian McKellen has ridiculously big hands. Yeah, I mean, his hands could have been OK for that shot, I think, yeah. but it was actually Paul. And I don't know if anyone listening has ever had a seven-and-a-half-foot man straddle them. It's quite a scary experience. Well, I hope not. And the fear that you see in my eyes here is actually more about that than about the Palantir. It was dead. This is a mix of two things. Like, that shot, I think, is from principal photography. But then they added some lines that they really wanted in, like the burning tree that you heard before, mm. which was done in pickups, like, two years later or something. So they had to match that shot. I think we went back to New Zealand two <laughs> years after we'd finished filming, or two and a half years after, to add some more scenes between Pippin and, and Ganda, because it was clearly a, a, a substantial strand in, in the story, and um, Peter felt we needed a little bit more of it. There was no lie. In it was done so piecemeal, however, that I've only got the a rather general impression that the. Pippin is naughty, uh, Peregrine Took, he's a fool of a Took. But that Gandalf loves him because he admires him and he admires his bravery, even as he's chastising him for his bumptiousness, really. And of course, in this scene, Thaden creates a kind of standoff that it's not obvious anymore now that things are moving on and, and I'm back in control. It's not that obvious that I'm going to be just another member of this group. I am the king, and I am the king of Rohan. And if you think that we're going to come to your aid, or I'm going to carry on just throwing my soldiers behind all this a variety of endeavours, then you're mistaken, unless it's OK with me. It's not an automatic assumption. Rohan must be ready for war. Which sets up a scene later on where he then says, when Aragorn comes in and says, Gondor calls for aid, and Theda then says, and Rohan shall answer. It's a wonderful piece of kind of long-distance tension, if you like. At this point, Gandalf is kind of taking a new kind of position in the story, becoming more of a guide as opposed to a leader. Certainly in the Fellowship, he's, he's more of a leader. Now he's kind of just saying, this is what's going to happen. I can't really get myself involved too much, but these are my suggestions, you know? It's mm -hmm. cool. I love this little scene. This tells an awful lot about these two characters. The sense that between the two of them, once Pip gets on the horse, that they might not see each other ever again is a terrifying prospect for both of them. But it's wonderful that Mary's ahead of him. Mary's a little more kind of emotionally developed and a little more mature than Pip. Pip's a kind of... He's a bit of an innocent, really. Well, they're all innocents in a way, but probably Pip is the most innocent of the four of them, I think. And Mary's there before him. It's a lovely scene, this. And you... You're coming with me? So this shot was done at one particular time. Yeah. And as we walk into the stable, that was done in reshoots. So this now was done not too long ago. Because we filmed this scene one way where, like, you're angry with me here. Yeah. But by the end, we kind of made up and you said, we'll see the Shire again. Which is in the trailer. Well, yeah, which is in the trailer. The not in then the Pete and Fran decided, 
that they liked it better that we haven't kind of so you're still angry with me I don't know what's happening yeah. and before you know it we're off yeah it's more dramatic yeah it is it leaves the audience thinking well I hope they get to see each other again because these two friends are now not leaving under the best possible terms this must have really hurt your winky dink going that fast never good on the horse good with good good never skill issues Dom aside from Frodo and Sam who have a kind of master and servant relationship one of the strongest relationships if not the strongest relationship in terms of just an out and out friendship is Merry and Pippin because right from the off they're best friends you know Legolas and Gimli have an incredible link by the end of the fellowship but that's grown throughout the trilogy and you know all these other relationships happen because of the journey that they take whereas Merry and Pippin have always been best friends they've known each other since they were babies it should really irk the audience that they're now off on separate journeys. But, you know, by the time we get to the third movie, everybody's off on their own separate journey. That's the whole point of the third movie, I think, is this furthermore breaking of the fellowship. This scene is very kind of... You should write scores. Yeah, it'd be good, wouldn't it? Mm. Take her by the safest road. A ship lies anchored in the grey head. Liv Tyler. She's got that high-pitched voice that I like. Hey, guys. What are you doing? That was a scene that Fran and Philippa wrote. I think mainly it was something that Fran came up with that she felt very strongly about. And it was initially going to be in the Two Towers. It was another one of those magical Fran gems of really trying to always trying to connect Arwen and Aragorn together somehow throughout this story, though they're so far apart. And in that moment, she's made the decision to leave Middle-earth because her father's told her just really that there is nothing there for her. There's nothing left, that there is no life for her in Earth. So she leaves, and along the way, she has this vision, which I guess is a sort of premonition of what will be. And in that moment, she sees her child and Aragorn, and it's very emotional for her. Number one, because she's seeing that, and it encourages her to then turn around and go back. But also, I think she's quite enraged at her father for lying to her, um, because he did see that, and he didn't tell her about that, and he sort of sent her on her way. Poor Liv, she spent the entire film just crying and reciting poetry. Well, Liv has a, a great beauty, but an inner beauty as well. And she taps into her emotions very easily. So she's a very open, emotional, warm being. And for an actor, I don't think you could want a better attribute than, than that sort of facility with your emotions. I think she's a natural, very giving actor. And it was, a, it was really lovely to work with her. I think the hardest things for me about portraying Arwen were the, the elven characteristics and take it all in, all these incredible traits that they have of being all-knowing, very keen eyesight and hearing, and they're incredibly kind and in touch with nature and in the world, and all these things are sort of these perfect beings, and then how to put that onto film, you know, in a realistic way that people could relate to them. I was always sort of trying to find the balance of that. And sometimes, in the beginning, I found it really stifling, and I didn't know how to let go. And as time went on, I learned how to try and let go of all that and just focus on the fact that she's also just a woman, and a woman in love, and willing to do anything she can to be with the man that she loves. I was often struck by her ability to embody that aspect of, of that particular character, too. And the sadness that, that was inherent in that character and the sadness that with being torn between her father and her love. Throughout the shooting, Fran and Philippa and I sort of naturally formed this really kind of special bond. And one of the great gifts, I think, that Peter has, one of the things that makes him such a brilliant director is that he's able to see that in the people that help him. He has this incredible sort of support team around him of people that are working with him. And he saw that and he really let us go with that. And so we just started to really talk and dream and, and come up with a lot of things. And um, obviously they were working on it all the time. I was just absolutely delighted when Fran started to direct the scenes with uh, Arwen and myself. And uh, 
I really loved the way in which she directed and the way in which she talked to the Liv and I and the fact that she'd also been so involved in the writing of it and the telling of that particular story. She always said the right things. She always seemed to say exactly the right things and certainly Liv responded very well to working with her and the scenes with that old one one that she directed were beautiful. I was given Bless His Heart by Richard Taylor one of Aragorn's swords, which was Narsil, and became Anduril when he reforged it, the sword that was broken. In Imladris it dwells. I'll tell you how they did these shots if you want them. Yeah. There's a couple of different ways, but normally we'd sit on a barrel, kind of pretend horse, and a tall pole would sit behind me, so that close-up shots of me, you'd still see Gandalf behind. And then sometimes, Ian could even be behind and he would sit on something and I would slink down to be as low as I could. Minas Tirith is described quite succinctly by Tolkien as a seven-tiered city. Minas Tirith. The centre of the Gondor lands, city of the kings. And each ring of the seven levels is separated from the rest by a gate. And in some of these shots, they had the barrel on a track. So when you see us riding, like with the, the stuff moving behind like this, yeah. that was actually a barrel on a track, which was hilarious trying to make it look real. The Gandalf who's galloping up is a computer-generated character based on my appearance and the movement of a real horse and a real rider. Great set, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. That's a miniature. But there was a lot of that set there. The, all this stuff. That was all a set that was built. And they're going up and up and up and up until there it is. That was a beautiful set, that one. It was a large space, and the indications were clear uh, of the palace, the great hall, although it was just the facade that we saw on that set. And then the white tree, rather magical uh, Gandalf. presence. Gandalf. Yes, the white tree of Gondor. The tree of... That's the tree you had a dream about, remember? Yeah. But Gandalf's like, whoa, just carrying on. This scene coming up, this was done in pickups. Lord Denethor is borrowing his father. Just like the idea of kind of explaining who he was a bit more. And also, I think, helps in showing the relationship between Gandalf and Pippin, which is quite nice. Basically, just will you be quiet? Yeah, just don't talk. Just don't do anything. And Pippin agrees. It's probably a good idea. What's happened... Um, just before this, is that Denethor's found out that his beautiful boy, Paramir, is dead. He's absolutely grief-stricken. And that grief is a, a, quite a contributing um, factor in his deterioration. And, and these two walk in and um, try to get him back to, you know, to matters of state. And also, will see that he has made the mistake of looking at the Palantir and, and therefore become corrupted in his visions. And he loved and trusted Boromir. Perhaps you come to explain this. The danger with Denethor was to play him as a, a silly old man, and he's not. Playing madness, you've got to be so very, very careful not to, um, to drop into cliché. This is still one of my favourite sequences in the first film. Mm -hmm. Look at our faces. We are absolutely gutted. John Noble is fantastically insane in this film. There's something so flamboyant, in a way, about his performance, but it so works for that character. I just remember every time I, really I would see it. him after seeing these scenes in the movie, it would take me a few moments to kind of expel the thoughts of how creepy he was. <laughs> like, God, you're just really creepy, man. But he's such a lovely man. Because of the nature of my role, I didn't really chat a lot with everyone. I'd do my preparation the night before, and when I got onto the set, I, I sort of kept very quiet, and I'd go back to my caravan and try and hold the moment, because Denethor was such a complex and lonely man that I didn't want to lose the mood. He fears Gandalf because Gandalf is, in fact, wiser than he is. 
and perhaps can see through him. But he's not a bad match for him, as we shall see. As steward, you are charged with the defense of this city. Where are now, steward doesn't mean king. Steward means that he's kind of caretaker king, looking after the place until the king comes back. But what's happened with Denethor is he's been steward for such a long amount of time that he kind of feels like he is king, that he is responsible, and that, you know, he should be treated as such. He has a, um, a lot of issues, you would yeah. say, in America. He's a truly tragic character in the Shakespearean mode. It's like King Lear. And so I had to go back and find the real man. And then what we see mainly is him in his distracted state. But to do that, I had to go back and find the other man. And the man that, you know, was married, fathered two sons and been a very, very fine steward of Gondor before he looked into the Palantir and corrupted himself. Well, he's not even allowed to sit in the throne. He has to sit at this little throne at the bottom of the steps. Right. Well, nobody sits in the big throne at the top. No. Which, you know, psychologically, that must play in your mind. Yeah. Rule of Gondor is mine! He sits alone. You notice he doesn't sit on the throne. He sits to the side of it because he's a steward. Basically, he's in a state of abject depression. The last thing he wants is to have his old foe, I suppose. Gandalf coming and tell him what to do. That was new as well. Yeah. A little bit now. That's one thing about the performances in the movie. We shot so many scenes that even in the extended version probably aren't aren't in there. So many hundreds of shots, thousands of shots. Oh yeah, not with... everything makes it to the extended, yeah. Yeah. I love the way these these guards here. Their faces are uh, blacked out. They kind of wear stuff over their faces so you can't see them. Mm. It's kind of like ninja. They're just guarding the tree. Yeah. Very, very important, Tom. Yeah. That would obviously be a miniature. Yeah, Alex Funky sure did his fair share of good work in these movies, to say the least. He's the, the miniatures cinematographer who actually won an Oscar, I think, last year for, uh, for his miniatures cinematography. And then this was... This was built, this part of the set, in the same place as we filmed outside the doors of Moria. That is fascinating. It's a sunny day that day, wasn't it? And they also huge lights, almost impossible to open your eyes. Yeah, you can see that with Ian McKellen there. I, it was blinding, a series of blinding, the eye-aching sunny days, and a white sap, and very little breeze and a heavy brocaded costume and wig and discomfort is what I remember. So here's a little tip for anyone who's doing any film acting. I know what and, you're gonna say. And they have a huge light shining in your face. Just before they say action, close your eyes and look at the sun. Close your eyes, mind you. Don't look directly at the sun. No. You'll blind yourself. You'll pierce your eyes. So close your eyes, look at the sun, and then when they say action, turn towards where you're supposed to look and open your eyes and you'll be able to open them a lot easier. Because mm, your pupils will be slightly dilated. The same way as they would be if uh, they were sexually aroused. Well. Lord of the Rings is a very, 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 very long story. And long as these films are, they're not long enough to get all the story in. And uh, one way around that problem is to get somebody to uh, keep reminding the audience what's going on. And as Gandalf has the overview and tends to know what's going on, I was the guy who had to keep everyone up to date with the story so far. Oh, this scene is back in, that's cool. I like this scene. I think we did this scene about 8,000 times. I mean, we, this was like take 437. Yeah, probably. we really spent quite a lot of time on a very short scene, which uh, we were kind of known to do. I, I love this scene because I love the notion that Frodo has a sense that he's not going to make it back to the Shire. That there's not that some kind of naive sense that he's going to be able to make it in his own mind. I, you know, I think it just keys you into the, the inherent kind of wisdom of Frodo, which I think is really important, particularly in this film. As he loses himself to maintain that knowledge that there is this, he knows what's going on. And the day we filmed this was the day that Sir Edmund Hillary came to That's visit right. the set which is absolutely extraordinary for me. I was uh, delighted being a mountaineer. It was a, a, a great day. 
For anybody who doesn't know, he was the first man to climb to the top of Mount Everest, he, to reach the he, peak. He and Tenzing Norgay. That's right. And I took a New Zealand $5 bill where Sir Edmund Hillary is on the, the Peter gave cover. me a $5 bill. He's like, here, have him sign it. I mean, I always saw Pete as a bit of an Edmund Hillary, really. Uh, Pete always told this great story of Edmund Hillary cutting steps in the ice up to the next base camp whilst all the other mountaineers were asleep. And then they'd get up in, get up in the morning and there they'd be, and like the elves and the shoemaker. And, uh, and Pete reminds me of, of, of him for that. So how about that for a mark on the world that New Zealand has made? It's pretty wonderful. I love that moment because it's so, um, it just shows the sweetness, you know, the sweetness of the holler. He's just got to drive them on. Yes, yes, we do, don't we? <sighs> we do, for those who are rapidly anti-smoking, put in enough anti-smoking propaganda, and one of them is, is the catch in the throat that Gandalf has during the scene with Pippin. <laughs> and water has to be brought, and we integrated it into the scene as if Pippin didn't quite approve of, of the rate at which Gandalf smoked. The, service of the, steward now. the scene where I'm looking at the sword and the uniform for Gondor, that was a new scene that they put in to explain where the uniform came from and, and also, you know, to show that Pippin doesn't want to fight. But before we filmed that scene, Pippin starts off in the bed and then when he hears Gandalf coughing with his pipe, he gets out of bed and pours him a glass of water. And you'll probably see at the start of the scene when Gandalf's smoking his pipe, I'm lying in my bed. Right. Uh, but then when it cuts to my side, I'm looking at my sword. What do you think of that? There's a type of things that Pete doesn't really care about, isn't it? It kind of makes me laugh, though. It makes me smile. He just doesn't mind about that stuff. He actually likes it when people pick up on that. Yeah, I like so that. Quiet. I think you're on your knees at this point, Bill. I'm on my knees there, Dom, to be honest. But waiting on the edge of what and I think Ian was there. Worse. Yeah, that would work. Yeah, I think that was just totally as it was. I love the scenes with Gandalf and Pippin, partly because just seeing how well they work, they played off each, opposite each other. And they work so well together, it's, it's great. Is this pickups? This was, it's a mix actually, because we did film the scene and then they added some stuff, like this. This is all new stuff, done in pickups. Just to explain that, you know, it's more than just orcs. There's, there's other races who, who support Sauron. Yeah, all the bad guys. There's Pete Jackson. There's PJ. Oh yeah, there he is. There he is. You know, that is the first time that I've seen that. Yeah, he's refused to tell people where he is, so I suppose I shouldn't have just said that. But... So Pete Jackson appears in all three films. What is he in the second one? He throws an arrow through a hole in Helm's Deep. And really? goes, Whoa! Yeah. But we have the white wizard. That's got to count for something. Pippin likes Gandalf a lot. Yeah. I think he feels like when he's got Gandalf, it can't be that bad. But he's doubting it here. I didn't know what I was getting into once I signed that contract. I thought it was just for fellowship with the ring. But I like the Witch King. Out of all the characters that I played, the only reason why I like the Witch King is because it only took 20 minutes in um, wardrobe to get ready for the Witch King. And, and 10 minutes to get out in Oz home with all the other characters, like with Gothmog. It was another four and a half hour prosthetic work over in the makeup chair, which is pretty much, you know, it was a breeze, actually, because of the Lurtz character I played in The Fellowship of the Ring, taking 11 hours, four and a half hours was just a walk in the park compared to that. I love the, that city, I think that's beautiful. What Fran and, and Philip are great at doing are, are writing, giving you moments of exposition like that, explaining to an audience where you are geographically or, or what the next phase of the journey is but it always sounding dramatic and it, it never sounds particularly like oh well here we are at the beginning of the stairs to Kerith Ungle. they always find a way of integrating it into character which is a rare thing i think up 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 the stairs we go and we did again and again and again on several different sections of staircase over several different years I remember being so physically uncomfortable during this. Just my back was hurting and my mm. kind of having that pack on and I was the, my fat just trying to climb up on those stairs and walking and I, I just realized that like my the muscles in my legs were starting to atrophy from sitting for so long for so many months in the hobbit feet and I just remember thinking like that's it I'm uh, you know 
It's really just us on a stage. I mean, I don't even know if those... Uh... Well, Mina Smorgal obviously wasn't there. What was on set was the bridge and the statues. What are those things, gargoyles or something? Or was... Those statues there, the gargoyles. None of the stuff going on right at the back of the shot was there, so that was all imagined. I didn't have a vision of it in my mind either. I don't know if there was any uh, sketches. That, had you seen sketches of it? I had. I had seen sketches, but I had. I couldn't remember the sketches when we were there. I just remember wanting to. So, I, so it was. I didn't know what my. They sort of set the mood, though. Those bestial things just kind of set the tone on the set. That was the thing I, I focused on because that was the only sinister thing to sort of pay attention to. That's a signal dome. That light thing. Right. Signals everyone to say that we're off to get Menace Terror. Kind of like a, a green on a traffic light. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go, go. Kill people. Yeah, which is wrong. I think I fly out because I'm all I'm looking at is a blue screen. I can't see any of this. And Peter's just saying, you know, you swoop down, you're flying down on your Nazgul. You're just looking around and just peering around and you're flying off to, to battle. And it's like, oh, you don't actually know, you're actually perched, but y y you can sense something. So, and your Nazgul is yeah, screeching, of course, but you're, you can sense that, that the ring's close. So just react to that. I always used to wonder when I was a kid what it was like if humans could be alive at the same time as dinosaurs and knowing that the sound that they would make at their size would be too painful for human ears to be on the size of our, you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. I, so I remember f just connecting with that idea that there's this huge, massive creature. Peter was really good at describing that stuff. And this was my favorite. When we actually did moments, we're tied in with all these extras walking by. I love the way the stuntmen, depending on what they were playing, would totally change their movements. Yeah. Of course, they had to all walk down this ramp, and then they had to stop and then back up the ramp together. and. The peripheral vision is bad, and they, so it, would, it was lumbering. It would take forever with them. Now, does it make this noise every time that the, um, the Witch King comes out in his Nazgul? Because that must annoy the neighbors. These stairs were pretty treacherous. Incredibly so, yeah, very steep. They were barely carved out. And they're made of polystyrene. They're not actual rock. There's a little bit of actual rock sort of, of would, layered on some top. Some of it would break. Break and you just fall. Yeah. And your sword, the scabbard of Sting, would poke me in the eye all the time. And it would also get stuck in the polystyrene In the polystyrene, well. so you get, and, and with the pack on, like trying to oh. navigate it. And then, just to make matters worse, you put the, the slick hobbit talking? feet on, and oh. they would squirt water on to give the rocks that sort of sheen. So it was like, it was, it was a lot more treacherous than one would think. Oh, there's a dark side to Sam as well, though, eh? Mm. You know? Yeah, he'll, he'll kill Gollum to protect Frodo. He'll do that. But there's not many hobbits who would, you know, threaten. You know, it shows you to say Frodo would do anything. He has been nasty. I has called him fat. Oh. You know, it's good for his Achilles heel and his hobbit's tummy. Nothing. But yeah, that is a great moment, Sean. I love that. And I think it, it is very valuable to your character And it's as well. pickups. It, you know, Fran and Pete and Philippa would, would watch stuff and they'd realize, like, it's two one note this way. Let's add a, a different dynamic. It's great to be able to play those moments, and I think it's great for the audience to be able to, you know, have that complexity. Yep, that depth. You must not fail me. I'm your little tinker. Hello? I'll go up and I'll light this beacon. I'll prove myself. It really dawned on me how integral Pippin is to the story because I love Billy so much and because of how extraordinary he is at doing everything from comedy to drama and everything in between, to, to see him sort of come into his own in the third film like this, particularly in the, in the upcoming scenes in Minas Tirith. Oh, yeah, it made my heart sing. It was oh. just great to see. Silence descends here because this is all totally new to me. The garrison may have moved out. Interesting thing for me watching, um, well, this sequence, for example, is the fact that, yes, it... It was filmed in New Zealand, but I can forget that now, and it totally becomes Middle Earth. And Pete brought in these new orcs this time who have tumours, not necessarily um, dangerous tumours, but just mutations. That's my finger. That's my tumoured finger. It's only got one finger and one thumb, and, um, and it's Gothmog, the orc sergeant. I got told by Bill Hunt, who did my makeup, that he actually did the full orc face without no tumours or anything 
growing out of it. And when Peter came to get Peter's approval on the actual finished marquette of Gothmog, Peter asked if he could use some of the clay and do a bit of work on it. So he just grabbed clumps of clay and just stuck, sticking it over one side. He goes, I want him to have like tumors coming. He's, so he's deformed. And that's how Gothmog ended up becoming really twisted and tumored up. And I think I was called Pimplehead while we were filming. A lot of the extras, under their breath, they wouldn't say it to my face, but they were calling me Pimplehead. See, this is Osgiliath, which is the real capital of Gondor, isn't it? Yeah. On the river there. Which has been slightly, well, abandoned. Well, because yeah. Because Minas Tirith is safer. Yeah. If you have a city on the river, it's vulnerable. Well, yeah. Because people bit. can attack from the water. With the Gothmog, the whole prosthetics covered my whole nose and you could only breathe through your mouth. And if you've been in there all day for a 12-hour, 10-hour shoot, at the end of the day, this mucus tends to build up under your nose. And as soon as they said cut, I would say, is that a wrap? Is that a wrap? Uh, hang on, I'll just check Lawrence, go see Peter. Is that a wrap on Lawrence and, and Caro? Yes, that's a wrap on Lawrence. I'd grab, the, I'd grab the prosthetics and just rip it open. Oh, you just couldn't wait to breathe. So footage is intercut here between um, pickups of 2003 and, and uh, principal photography, I think, of three years prior to that. We put that sequence together rather quickly because most people were up to speed with the, um, the stunt group by, by that period of time, so it didn't take terribly long. Bang! Take that. See, Daisy Wenham's got some spirit. Yeah, he's really going for it. The man has spirit. Why'd you call him Daisy, Dom? Well... I mean, I call him Daisy because people who have worked with him before call him Daisy Wenham, such as Miranda Otto and Hugo Weaving, I think, have both worked with Daisy Wenham. But it just became common knowledge after a couple of weeks of hanging out with Daisy, or David, that uh, the people that really knew him called him Daisy and that he responded to that. So from then on, it was, it was Daisy Wenham. Do you know why they call him Daisy, though? Is it just because it sounds like David? Probably, yeah, I think. What does he... Does he make nice flower arrangements? Not that I've seen. No, not that I've seen, but I wouldn't put it past him. So here we are at the beacon, Dom. Mm -hmm. It's very high. Oh, God. Good yeah. climbing skills. Well, it just shows, you know, the Pippin in the third movie that you see is not the Pippin from the first. Now, he's, high, he's how high up, up are you here? Well, just about eight foot, to be honest. Right. Yeah, maybe about ten foot till you get to the wood, and then had to climb up the wood here. Because you're quite scared of heights, aren't you? I don't like heights too much, to be honest, Dom. I don't like heights either. And you then... You weren't shackled? No, no, I just did it. And then we tried to work out a kind of interesting way to do this, and this, like, this was, um, Pete. Like, the idea it was broken, and I've done it. Yeah, you did happy in anything. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Heavens. I'm getting out of here. The day that we actually filmed the beacon actually going in fire here, that was pretty exciting, because they did have the full-size beacon, which they, they set light to, and then... I would climb down a little bit of the rock next to the beacon and run out a camera shot. And then I'd run back in and I'd climb down a little bit of rock again and, and run out. And I did this until it became completely unsafe with the, the wood all falling. And uh, that shot doesn't even appear in, in, the, in the movie at any point. Risking your life. I could have died. I think it was Peter who said as well that um, <laughs> of a Monty Python moment, really, with the beacons. The fact that as you, you know, you're going now to all the beacons throughout the lands, that a couple of people have sat there next to those beacons for 700 years, just waiting for them to be lit. And then I said, but Pete, you know what the guys who lit the beacon, I said, do they kind of live up there? <laughs> I mean, how long do they wait? I mean, are they there for all their lives, just in case somebody wants to light the beacon and then they've got to be there all the time? It'd be a bit of a bummer, really, if you were one of the generations who didn't get the opportunity to light the beacon, especially if you lived to a ripe old age. I said, well, how did they light them? How did, how did they keep the beacons dry? Because there's snow and everything. I said, where, where did they live? Have they got little huts up there as well? So we went into this big kind of very amusing fantasy rap about these beacon lighters, and it's a, they think it's a family thing, and it's the box of matches. Each generation is kind of vows to keep dry and available to light this beacon that, that flares up in seconds. 
I mean, look at that. How do you get up there to do that? Look at that. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Yet it is so clever when you think about it, you know? Of course, these beacons that are set off in a row that it can span hundreds of miles, and finally it'll, you know, in time, it'll get to the people that it needs to get to. Run, Vigo. I was talking to Vigo about this, like, and he's saying, well, what should I be doing? What, I had to work out what I should be doing. And he has to go hair and across up these very impractical steps. <laughs> I don't know how many times he did this, but Pete did put him through an awful lot. The tight shot of Miranda and myself was done as a pickup. Uh, we weren't actually there uh, when they originally shot the scene, we weren't in it. Brand new frock for, I don't know, about a minute of, uh, well, not even a minute, a few seconds of screen time, isn't it, really? It's so reassuring, Eowyn, that uh, everything was all right. This time round for this movie, I had a lot of I had a lot of rewriting because basically when we'd shot the movie, I was I was really well covered for the second film and the story was really clear. But in the in the third movie, in Return of the King, the story was all over the place because it had changed so much from the original scripts that they had written. And as we ran out of time, as we were shooting it, it was hard to place it all together and fix up the things that needed to be fixed because there was so much being shot right near the end. Basically, when we came back for reshoots, it was a matter of putting her story back together, taking out the bits that didn't fit and putting in other bits to make everything fit together. Because originally, I didn't ride off to Dunharrow with them. I was standing and watching them right away. But then when we were shooting it, suddenly I was at Dunharrow. I was saying, how did that happen? I was watching them leave, and, and now, I'm, now I'm here. And, and you know, it, sort of, it was very confusing and muddled. And so a lot of the reshoots for me were just restructuring the story. I have a sword. Please accept it. Now, this sequence here was one of the things that I was most disappointed losing in the theatrical version because it's a huge part of the book. Mary offers his service to Theoden. Pippin's already offered his service, so it'd be nice to watch Mary do it. It's probably the reason why it wasn't in the theatrical release. Ah, oh, right. Is because you don't want to over-egg the pudding. It'd be quite nice to see you both there. Uh, What's the hobbits doing? Yeah, just That's show that their lives, even separate from each other, are still mirroring yeah. one another. And also, I like eggy pudding. Look, he can't move it. I spoke with Pete, and he liked the idea of, of Mary raring to go and sitting on a horse, and then the horse just... <laughs> it's, it's great. On ADR, we did a spoof of this, this kind of internal thought. What else could it, would he be saying here? Right, I fed the cat. Doris is coming in to look after the budgie. Oh, fuck it, I left the gas on. Peter came up to me and said, I really want something from AMR at this point to motivate the troops and remind everybody of their um, honor and their loyalty and the commitment and their reason why they were going. And um, he opened the book and found the appropriate sequence and got the back of his sides and scribbled down four or five lines of dialogue. And so I went off and learnt them and not even half an hour later or 15 minutes later, we were shooting that, uh, that speech. I think sometimes in huge budget, epic scale films, performances can sometimes be substandard because of that. But to Peter's great credit there, he puts the performances number one and everything else there is, um, that does balance and support it. I must say, I, that, that particular moment is, um, <laughs> it's a very Peter Jackson moment there, the fact that all those arrows were fired by the Gondorians, but all just happened to miss Faramir. Tell them to break up. We write the minister. It's great, because it shows the hecticness of battle and, and the randomness, you know, yeah. of what happens, that sometimes it doesn't matter if you're the greatest fighter in the world. You can just turn a corner and, and get hit with a stray arrow or an, an axe, and it's all over. During the sequence where the Nazgul come over there, there's one particular take where a Qantas plane came over just at the moment where a Nazgul was supposed to come over, since we were filming right next to Wellington Airport. Very contemporary Nazgul. It's great, and the way the Nazgul kill people is just to pick them up and crush them and then drop them on other people. Yeah. Kind of killing two men with one man. What? <laughs> that scene there where I had to grab the spear off him, I couldn't look down because I didn't know where the camera was and I draw the spear up and then plunge it down but I could just see a little space in between his arm and his body 
and that's where I've got to hit. <laughs> Lucky I hit it every single time, otherwise I don't know what I would have done if I had missed my mark, even though it's only a plastic spear. But, oh, you can still inflict damage. I know I've been hurt by a plastic sword by Miranda. I was talking to someone who was doing these sequences with the fell beasts and they were showing Pete how they were lifting up a guy and dropping it down. And Pete said, it's great, yeah. He said, but why? It was just lifting up a guy. Why didn't it run through and lift up three guys on their horses? And that's just the way Pete works, isn't it? That's bad. Some people might ask, why is he taking Pippin out? Right. Would you ask that, Dom? I would. Why is he taking Pippin out? <laughs> and I'll tell you why, Dom. Because when this was originally filmed, this was Gandalf and Pippin just arriving in Minas Tirith. Well, I suppose Pippin would like to see him, the Nazgul zapped, wouldn't he? And, and you can't trust Pippin to be left on his own, perhaps. You get the feeling that, like, well, why didn't he do that all the time? Every time the Nazgul appear, why didn't he just switch it on? Was it kind of limited battery life or something? You're only allowed 15 second bursts of it. <laughs> That's it, you've used all your credits on it, so I'm sorry you can't use it again. It's true, and, 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 and so when I asked Peter Jackson, why can't I just zap my enemies with the same simple bolt of light? He said, oh, well, sorry, and uh, the thing is Gandalf's run out of batteries, and, and the, so is the shop in Minas Tirith, so we, you won't be able to use your uh, staff in that way. Oh, oh. Well, that seemed as uh, credible an explanation as any. The bridge in the West Bank. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever get the opportunity to work on a film again that has a set whereby you can actually ride however many horses in and actually engage in a in a, a scene on that set. I think in that kind of circle just there was one of the first press conferences that we ever had in New Zealand. Oh yeah. Yeah, we had a day where the entire fellowship turned up and we we spoke about the journey thus far and how it was all looking and it and it gave us guys the opportunity to see Minas Tirith because obviously I didn't film too much. Well, I didn't film anything there. So to, to have a look around and see it was great. Astonishing. And these streets were real. They'd built Minas Tirith, the quarry north of Wellington. I love Minas Tirith, I think it's beautiful. Yeah, it is, it's nice. This is new, isn't it? You would risk oh, this be the new scene. I think this scene shows the uh, the schism that appears in the relationship between Denethor and, and Faramir. You sent the ring of power into Mordor! When we were doing the these scenes, everyone knew that the stakes were really high. This was a very hard scene for me because it, it crosses uh, all of the emotional fields. So it's a very difficult thing to act, this one. There was a, a sense of, if we get this right, um, we've got something special. And so there was always this sense of hushed respect on the set. When we were filming, it wasn't by design or by choice or anything, but John and I didn't actually have very much to do with each other. During the filming, it was always a good morning to morning, John. We didn't really talk to each other. We didn't spend very much time together. That's also just part of keeping that, that method going. And it wasn't something that we were conscious of, it was just something that I think because he was Denethor and I was Faramir, we just it sort of just happened that way. But it's funny, I hadn't thought about it until we reflected afterwards that we'd actually kept our distance from each other during the process. Because it helps. That fall, which we had to too many times, I had the biggest bruises on my butt. And every, we, when we first started, you know, they'd put down a, a cloth or something or other uh, for me to land on, and I was going to protect my fall with my hand, as you do. But Peter said, no, that looks fake. And we said, all right, we'll just do it. And sort of finished up, they took away the protective stuff, and uh, I just did it. I was so bruised, I can't tell you. I've actually got a photo at home, which I never will show anyone, but it's of my bruised butt. What we do for art, eh? I told Peter later, but it didn't seem to affect him. <laughs> but it was worth it. I loved this scene. Leave me. It was challenged every acting skill I had. He's so 
I hate to be seen. It was so tiring. Yes, precious, you were a wimp. You always wanted to go back to your trailer. No, no, I didn't. Don't tell him that. I'm a very hardworking actor. No, you're not. You skive off whenever you can. <laughs> up, 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 up. Set for slightly down there. Careful, master. And then back up again. I remember Elijah saying that he'd come back from a day's work. Everything would just be sore, his elbows and his forearms and his fingers and his chest and stuff because all jacket rocks. And I thought, I'd love to hold you tight and just make you feel all better. Now, when he sees this ring, it's the first time he's seen it in this film and he can't help himself. And there's desperation. It's involuntary. He's being drawn towards it. But there is all, always that moment of, there is always that moment of connection with Frodo still. I mean, even at that point, there is still that moment of connection. The thing is, I just wanted my lunch. By this time, we'd shot it four or five times. My lunch was taking his time. I was exhausted. No, no, no supposed to say these things. Look, I'm being truthful. Everybody else is blowing smoke up other people's asses. I'm saying the truth. I love that moment as he's sort of starting to plant in my mind the seed for which, you know, will blossom the great schism. The betrayal. The betrayal. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Any so grade crazy. school kid knows what it's like to have to have a friend say something to another friend and turn them against you. you know? mm. Because I played the Witch King and Gothmog, it was I had to talk to myself, but myself was actually a pink cross. You're looking down at yourself now, or else you're looking down at Gothmog. You're giving him your orders, and then two weeks later, I'll come back as Gothmog. And do you remember that scene we did two weeks ago, where you're getting giving yourself orders? And I went, yeah. Well, now you're giving him your boss. It was it totally confused me. It was confusing me that I was uh, playing the same characters and throwing different lines at it. It was just really, really hard. And I, I couldn't wait till it actually came on screen to actually see that. <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, this is a new scene. This is one of my favorite scenes in the script, actually, when we, when we originally shot the film. I like this scene actually, and I'll tell you why, though. Go on. <laughs> this, uh, I think it sets up the relationship with Faramir and Pippin a bit, so that you know at the end when he's in the fire and stuff, it just gives it an extra kind of the stakes are higher, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because in the book they become quite good friends, don't they? Yeah. This was yours. You see, so it's uh, it was his uniform when he was a boy. Wow. A passing of the torch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're cute. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, you are. So is David. It's one of the cutest scenes ever filmed. I thought that it showed, you know, the essential Faramir in a way, somebody who was, you know, extremely kind, considerate, thoughtful individual. But the thing is, playing a human and working with hobbits, you didn't actually get to work with. Billy was obviously there, but when the camera was on me, I'd be working with one of the scale doubles purely so I get the eye line correct. And one day your father will see it. Yeah, some wisdom from uh, Pippin here. He's growing up, you see. Do I swear fealty and service to Gondor? This um, scene we're watching now, where Billy swears allegiance, it was quite important for me because what it gave me was a chance to show humanity at the beginning of it, just to look down and why he liked this hobbit. I don't know. I suppose he saw the honesty in the face. And the fact that this hobbit would swear allegiance to him probably touched him. And the character, Pippin, did it against the advice of um, Gandalf, too. But this was very powerful stuff, and I was so proud of Billy. He's got some wonderful material in this third film. With vengeance. In the ideal world, actors should be listened to, but a lot of the time, you really don't get time to consult too much. But in this, it's very much more collaborative. And I think someone told me once that Peter said to Philippa, listen to the actors, they know more about their characters than we do. Which was very insightful of him because that's in fact what the actor's job is, to know the character inside out. 
Peter empowered the actors as much as possible and he'd let the actors have all their own choices in terms of performance. It's only when he thought that there wasn't something working that he would then offer suggestions and, and direction, which was, his direction was always spot on because he knew, he obviously knew the story better than anybody and he, um, he also knew the character's storylines, um, certainly as well as the actors, if not better. Such a hard thing to do because it's so kind of, it's self-pity, but encased in the truth of the fact that he's going to go and risk his life now. Okay, Father, this is what you want. I'm, I'm going to do it. And I know that it's not going to make a bit of difference. And that's the other thing that's so incredible about that decision. One day, I was watching that reverse being shot, and when he got that take, I felt this, I was watching on the monitor, I felt this jump in my heart. And I did go up to him then and said, I just I saw that take, David, that's fantastic. This shot was created in the motion capture studio of Gollum being asleep. I always wanted him to be whiffling when he was asleep. There's lots of great descriptions of, of uh, Tolkien describing him being asleep, like he's never totally relaxed, like there's always something going on underneath, like this, this breath is uneasy and that he's always on pins, even when he's, you know, supposedly relaxed. But here he's duping Sam, pretending to be asleep and we see what he's about to do now. This is his chance. This particular set of rock was most famously housed at a squash court at a hotel outside of Queenstown. And there was a flood when we were meant to be there filming exterior shots, and we had to go to cover set. And at that point, we'd only been filming uh, scenes from film one from Fellowship. And because of the rain and the fact that our sets had been washed away, we were faced with uh, a scene from film three. As, I remember the cover. sheer terror, you and I looking at each other's eyes like, I don't remember who said to who, but it was like, are you ready? Or, I, don't, I don't think, I, I'm not ready, are you ready? Oh, no. yeah, there and we were, were like, well, let's just go and talk to Pete and tell him we can't shoot this scene today. I remember there, was that. A, <laughs> there was a moment of panic, and I do believe we did have that conversation of, we can just tell him that we're not ready and we won't shoot it. Yeah. That I, there was some odd logic, like it was that frightening to us that we had not yet gone there with our characters that we didn't think it was actually possible. You know, and it's a real credit to Peter well, I just remember and that the, and the, his the eye, time like, that he allowed us to have to get there. What I valued about what Pete did was, was he just had confidence. I remember, like, we, we broached the topic with him sort of as a question, and I just remember him sort of cocking his head and this little glimmer in his eye, and he was like, no, you'll do it. You know, and he, he just kind of... He had there ultimate was, confidence. Yeah, there was us. no failure. And failure was not an option, and we were going there today, and it was going to be great. And, you know, in three years' time, people are going to be sitting in a movie theater watching these moments that we're shooting right now, that you're watching right now, and... Uh, and it's a uh, wonderful scene as well. I mean, it, you know, a hell of a thing to jump into because it is so different from anything that we had done, but also exciting on the level that we had the opportunity to play these moments, which are wonderful moments. So we all basically played our characters' beats in different years. This scene uh, did change a lot. Like, I think a lot of the scenes in which we would add a moment or two to uh, during the pickups, because it's obviously had, you know, a year, two or three to have some breathing room and to gain some perspective on where we want that scene to go. Lion rat! What did you do with it? I remember we took ages deciding how to play this moment, not so much on set, but on the motion capture stage and then in ADR, we played that those lines over and over and over again to try and find how you'd say he took it, he took it. He took it. On set, we actually sh shot Sean pummeling into me, and uh, he actually did the shots when the, the shots were on Gollum, and then he was beating sandbags when, when the shots were just on him, so he could really lay into them. But he still gave me a bit of a run for my money. Around take 12, you'd be you'd be thinking, God, do I have any more? And it, you'd just go flat for three or four takes, and then you'd go back and, and you'd, you'd look get, at it. You'd and get back into it. Yeah. And then you'd rediscover it, new, a new layer of, of motionality. So, like, it was like a learn how to cry boot camp and war and playing with all the different variations of crying, you know, the sort of actor thing like, oh, I'm just going to fake it because I can't do anything else. And then, okay, that's not good enough. Now I'm going to, I'm exhausted. So if I don't find a way to have it be real, I'm going to have to just keep doing it over and over again. So... There was always a journey within those scenes to get to where we needed to get. 
and it would take, you know, a certain amount of time to navigate through some of those roads to ultimately get where we needed to be. Or we, or I would feel in my heart of hearts that I just nailed the emotional pinnacle of it sort of on the first rehearsal when Pete, when we got there when we weren't even in costume and stuff. And, right. and then you sort of think, now, now you're going to spend the next sort of six hours trying to... The next 12 or 13 hours. 12 or 13 hours, like getting back there, but then you, don't, you never want to repeat. That's not, you're not trying to do something that you already did. You always want it to be new, so... But, you, but you'd be lying to yourself if you didn't say that you have some emotional memory of what it was that you did. So, and then once you finally recapture the, the power of it, then, then pushing through and, and exploring new, new layers. It's, it's, uh, it was a pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's like a, you know, emotional acting aerobics. Yeah. Probably the first, the first time that I cry in the cinema when I'm watching it was at this particular point. Because... <laughs> He didn't do anything wrong, did he? No. I hate that. Sometimes that's what happens in life, though. Really? Yeah. You're going about your business and somebody throws away your limbass spread. Metaphorically. Of course. I think this is really sad. You know, the knowledge that they're going to die. This is where he said he would try and take back a skillet. It's a suicide mission, absolute suicide mission. It's a matter of duty, brave and foolhardy. The noisy eating, riding out to death sequence. And I just think it's incredible that they're not actually, you know, they're not streets that existed. All of that was purpose built for, for riding out on the streets of Minas Tirith. My armor rather, rather cumbersome in a way, the old armor. It was extremely practical, but not conducive to marvellous horse riding. And Steve Old, the, um, the horse master, asked if I'd ridden horses before, and I said, yes, I had. I'd ridden them for, for movies. And he said, oh, well, here's your horse. Get on it. And got on the horse and sort of trotted and cantered around a bit, but, you know, didn't have a great relationship with the horse. But, oh, all right. And then it got to the stage where we had to do a sequence, and it was like, OK, and action. But the, um, the horse literally went in the other direction and it was like 10 minutes before I could actually bring it back to the set. I knew that there was something slightly wrong with uh, my relationship with the horse. The uh, horse master told me that he'd bought the horse for $200. It sort of goes with the whole Faramir character, really. So, oh, Faramir, give him the cheapest horse. Nobody loves him. Probably a gift from Denethor. It was the cheapest horse we've got, 200 bucks. Give it to Faramir. In this particular sequence here, um, there was a second camera who'd been following. They'd done the sequence maybe three or four times up and down the stretch of Paddock, and the second camera said, yep, yep, no, we're terrific, absolutely terrific. We were following Faramir the whole time. We've got some brilliant stuff, absolutely brilliant stuff. And I said to Jeff Murphy, oh, Jeff, would you mind if we just had a bit of a squeeze at that particular sequence just to see if the riding ability's OK? And um, we rewound the footage on the, the video split and looked at it, and I said, yeah, it's pretty good, Jeff, really, really good. The fact is that the camera wasn't actually on me. Um, that's not me. <laughs> there was a charged atmosphere on, on the set when we were doing the, the singing, eating one. It was charged. You could, you could hear a pin drop. So this sequence happened quite late. It um, wasn't in a script. Was it principal photography, this bit? Um, I'd like to say yes. In fact... I can say yeah. yes, and I'll tell you why. Because the song that comes up here, I think someone was supposed to write, but they changed the schedule, so they didn't have time to write it. And they asked me if I could write something. The world. I mean, it's beyond simply asking him to sing and use his vocal talent, but to use his songwriting ability and rely on that and, and trust in that is incredible. And I think it's a really important point to make about Peter. You know, I think he was always paying attention to the talent around him and trying to utilize it as best he could. I wanted it to to have a sort of Celtic feel and an old feel to it. So I listened to some old sort of Scottish music because I wanted it to sound like it wasn't really something that Pippin would sing. It's not something that Pippin and Mary would, you know, stand on a table and sing in a, in a bar like they do earlier in the movie. Mm wanted it to sound like it's a song that his granddad would have sang or, you know, in a time 
before the hobbits lived in the Shire, when they were still looking for a home. And that's, I came up with that tune. When he sang that, I think it just took everyone by surprise. You we hold your breath, saying, oh my God, that is so beautiful. I certainly had tears in my eyes. I'm sure everyone else did too. I actually remember coming into work and I saw Victoria Sullivan, who worked on continuity on the film on main unit. And I said, how did the song go? And she said it was fantastic. And she said that she was crying. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's, that's nice. Yeah, that's sweet. Mm. This is the Roman, the Roman, the Ronan, the Ronan. <laughs> the Rohan <laughs> camp at Dunharrow, which is effectively a place where they all come together before the final push into battle. Grimbold, how many? This bit, Grimbold, how many, and that bit, it was just a way of gathering information about how many uh, of, the, of the commands were there and how many weren't. And I had terrible hay fever. You know, I'm kind of allergic to horses and sometimes grass. Not a good combination here. Or for the press junket, which we did in LA before this was released in the cinema. And they decided to make it look like a Rohan camp and had grass and hay and all that in there, which really affected Dom. How many times do you think I should use that day? Honestly, 4,000. Yeah, yeah, honestly. Which got me to the point that I laughed so much I wet myself at once. Well, we'll on a plan. Yeah. Sorry about that. And this bit was done in... Where was I shot, Dom? <laughs> I'm not too sure. <laughs> not too sure about that. Um, New Zealand. There you go. Definitely New Zealand. Dunharrow was actually filmed. It was a re remarkably beautiful location. There was the encampment, which was filmed just outside Queenstown. We went to get to this location, it was quite isolated. We all had to get up at six in the morning and hop into a small Cessna plane and fly across Milford Sound, land on a, uh, a sheep paddock and hop into four-wheel drives and get driven up to this, uh, this spot that they'd chosen. That mountain is here. It was quite a, quite a common occurrence, really, that travelled to the most remote parts of New Zealand. Kind of like the ring, he's drawn to that area. So I don't know why. What does he see? Vigo's a very intense method actor. I think he has a real nobility about him. I consider him to be a friend and uh, a wholly admirable fellow and a magnificent actor. I was inspired by watching uh, Vigo and his commitment. You know, when I think about Vigo, I think about commitment. And he, in due course, inspired everybody else to rise to the same level, or to at least try to. A true esquire of Rohan. Some nice shots there with me on my helmet. I think my, our helmets were cursed, Bill. I don't yeah. know why we didn't like it. It's because we've got tiny little, uh... What? Tiny little heads. Ah, oh, right. See, you jumped in too quick there. Well, you left a pause. Now, this is one of those scenes where I never even saw Dominic when I was doing it. I, I did the scene with somebody else, and he shot his after me with somebody else. And then he wasn't there in that shot either. I was just trying to push along fresh air, really. It's one of the more revealing scenes about Emma and Elwyn's relationship. I remember Peter, and we were trying to go for a double-edged thing for, you know, on one hand, trying to scare her a little bit, and then the other hand, also trying to be tender and gentle with her, really trying to connect. In fact, when I, look, when I look at that scene, I can, you know, I remember Peter, Peter was just wonderful, the way he guides you through a scene. He really is like a conductor. And I can, I can still see Peter's eyes, because Peter had this way of actually acting everything out for you a little bit. You know, to help in his sort of explanation of what he wanted, he would also kind of show you a little bit or feel it. I mean, he felt all the characters. I mean, you'd see him in the monitor and he would be behind there feeling it all 100% and going through the motions. And so when I look at the monitor and I look at myself doing the scene, I can still see Peter's eyes looking at me as he's doing the scene to me. As far as the appendix goes, the, the story of Arwen and Aragorn, or Aragorn and Arwen in the appendix, is it, it's really detailed and it really tells 
the history of these two people and then from the moment they meet until the moment they die. And there were so many amazing, magical, romantic sort of ideas and, and scenes and moments in that. But unfortunately, a lot of them we couldn't actually tell because um, the time frame that the films take place in is not the same as the book. So there was a lot of things that actually happen post to the films um, that we wanted to be able to tell in the story because they really showed to the extent that Arwen loved Aragorn and what she was willing to do to be with him. And so Fran came up with this idea to sort of tell a lot of those scenes through flashbacks or through this sort of intuitive connection that Aragorn and I would share, or these visions and premonitions, which happen all throughout the films. Yes. So it's a good little moment of drama here, because you might think it's Arwen. Is that Arwen? Is it Mary? We don't know. Could be Mary. It's too tall for Mary. It's not it's that guy from the Matrix. My Lord Elrond. Aragorn and Elrond uh, have been bound together for many, many years, and if you read the books, it becomes very, very clear. It's not quite as clear in the, in the films. It's a storyline that, because there are so many storylines, it's a storyline that hasn't been fully fleshed out. But his relationship with Aragorn is very much one as father to son, and he's a mentor to Aragorn. The difficulty with his relationship with this son figure is that actually this son figure is in love with his daughter. That Aragorn is a human being and his daughter is an elf uh, or is an Eldar. If she stays with him, she will be living in without him because ultimately Aragorn will die. Also, Elrond knows that Aragorn is or should be the king of Gondor and that ultimately he has to put aside the ranger and become this king figure that he and really Elrond is the one who who has the ability to to push him into into doing just that. So that's that's really Elrond's major role, I suppose, in in the third film, is to spur Aragorn into taking up the sword. In the same way I give Andrew to um, Aragorn, uh, it's not concealed under my cloak for the whole scene it, it you know you wait for the for the close-up and then give me the sword and it seems to come out of the cloak but yeah it was a huge absolutely enormous sword and much harder to wield than for instance the elvish sword that I, uh, Elrond I wielded extremely beautiful but much heavier very masculine kind of you know, phallic I suppose but enormous steel object but that was actually practically quite difficult to just lift it up and out of behind the cloak. It was great with, um, with Vigo because we, we both really enjoyed learning the Elvish and trying to in inject as much Elvish as we could into the scenes. Of course, some of the scenes would be changed in English and therefore they had to be changed in Elvish. And so learning Elvish at the last minute is well nigh impossible. So it did become difficult, but certainly um, Vigo and I were of like minds, and I found Vigo. I mean, as everyone knows, he's a Renaissance kind of guy. You know, he's a, he took the whole story very seriously and completely embraced um, the world and his character's journey and all the little um, aspects of that character. He'd kind of take on board as part of himself. And so, when you're on set with Vigo, it's you know you're seriously involved in the work at hand. And how you can how you can make that work, and the, the minute eye of each moment, and so from that point of view, completely different uh, again from say working with Liv, or completely different from working with Ian McKellen, or completely different working with all of them. I mean, all actors are different. We're all human beings. We're all different. But that's certainly Vigo's great strength is his ability to create this? and fully realise the, the character situation. We originally had a, a scene, something like this, but I was really furious in the scene, and, and in the end, I think we thought that it was was too angry and kind of alienating. Also, it was it was shot inside a tent, and just all the whiteness of the background in there just wasn't very interesting to look at. And I think they wanted to get something with trees and horses, just something with a, a nicer backdrop to it. He has nothing left to give. He can barely hold together his brain for one woman. 
You can't separate his mind into two separate vital components and keep one for a strawberry blonde and one for a, a dark-haired elf. And then whatever's left to kind of work out how he's going to, you know, be king of the lands of uh, Gondor. So a third, I guess. Well, less than a third. Maybe he might separate a half of that task and then have to give a quarter each to two women and there's no space for that. What's he going to do for the eating part of his brain? Well, he, he couldn't eat. The lembas bread is, is, is gone. Don't worry, Eowyn. Soon mm -hmm. you'll be on a horse with Mary. Where do you think you're off to? That sequence where Aragorn tries to sneak off and go and take care of the parts of the dead and, and Legolas and Gimli come up and say, you didn't think you were leaving without us. That was filmed just around the bay from where I was living in Wellington. And then there's a cut to another time, another place. It's just so funny when you look at how it all cuts together. You know, and you think about how we were down in this beautiful location in Queenstown, shooting that sequence, and then we moved, just for that little insert, down to, to Wellington. Back to Wellington at some point and just shot it, like, months later. He's got to go down the road to ruin. And that's one of my, one of my doubles on the back with uh, the real Orlando. I think that may have been the lady double. Why does he leave on the eve of battle? Bruce Hopkins plays... Gambling. Gambling. Right hand man to King Theoden. Yeah, owns the only casino in Edoras. <laughs> this is one of my favourite scenes, this, this little bit. It's Bruce as well, and it's nice because he's his character developed, he was just kind of a sidekick, a non-speaking role, really. And then we decided that we should all kind of pump it up a little bit. Now this one... Well, this is the scene, this is the last scene that we, that we did on principal photography. It was a very sad day because we knew that it was all ending. And that kind of added to the, the sadness of the scene. The people are to follow your rule in my stead. Bernard has such a, a rich quality about him. Everything he says just comes across with such depth. I don't know if that's just because he's that kind of person that everything resonates in that way. But I, I really enjoyed working with him. He has a, a great weight behind him, I think. Do you believe that he's a king? You believe that he's lived through a lot. Duty. And I liked the fact that I didn't have to cry in this scene. So many scenes, they wanted me to cry. I don't like crying very much because I always think it looks like you're feeling sorry for yourself as a character. So it was nice in that scene that we just went for something sort of more removed than upset. Not grieve. Crying is really difficult. <laughs> takes an enormous amount of concentration for me. Particularly if it's expected of you, if someone says they want that to happen. If they don't tell you they want it to happen, sometimes it just happens and then it's brilliant. But, but when you're trying to cry, I find it really difficult. No more despair. The paths of the dead. It was an incredible location. You know when you're on the beach and you make little sandcastles out of dripped sand? It was kind of like that. It was as if somebody was just dripping rocks one on top of another. And they were just these huge pinnacles. Shooting this, we flew out on a helicopter. It was one of those sort of, you know, as a, as a young actor, first movie, one of those movie moments. We did so much stuff in helicopters, though, that it became sort of like taking a bus. We shot this with Philippa and Fran. We flew out to the brain dead location across the water from where I was living. It was a beautiful location, small crew. Really small crew, just a cameraman, a couple of horse people. Had to be really limited. Guerrilla shooting, Fran Welsh style. And it was great. We shall call them from the grey twilight. Most of the lines we were using there from, were from the book, and they were some of the best. The best dialogue, actually, was like for, was some of that real deep imagery that Tolkien was initially creating in The Lord of the Rings. Could put so beautifully, like winter thickets coming up through, you know, and the. I see shapes of men and horses, and the way that it was, it was all very magical and sort of spooky and, and mysterious. You know, when you walk into the, into the parts of the dead, I mean, obviously we just walked into like a black curtain sort of thing. I do not fear the dead. Somebody get rid of this curtain, it's in the way. I mean, I actually had a line there. I'm so gutted it isn't there because it's only for this purpose, for this reason only, because my makeup artist, my second makeup artist, gave me this ring, which was inscribed with to wherever it may lead, which was at that point in the third movie. That was what Legolas says. 
I do not fear death to whether it may lead. You know, Vigo says, Aragorn says, he says, I do not fear death and goes in. Legolas was supposed to say, to wherever it may lead or something, you know, and go in. And then Gimli goes in and, you know, says, well, if a dwarf can go, can't go into an underground where a, an elf can, then what sort of a dwarf am I? I was really gutted when I saw the third movie and that line wasn't there, just because that was the one line with the ring on it. And I was like, and I've been telling everyone, yeah, it's a line from the third movie. And... But um, it was so funny because we'd walk in there and then suddenly get caught up in a whole load of curtains, black curtains. Here they go, put the fires out, collect all the horse crap. This was shot in Wellington by uh, John Mahaffey directing, I believe. And funnily enough, if you were to look straight out from where we were, you'd be staring at the city. I mean, it was literally right there. That's such as the magic of filmmaking. Little hobbits do not belong in war, Master Meriadoc. There's Merrick getting ready. No doubt in his mind that he's coming with them. But hold on. Bad helmet, though. I will say no more. Can't be any clearer than that. You know, I mean, it comes from a nice place. Theoden doesn't want him to die, he wants to protect him, he doesn't want him to see the things that he's gonna see, but Merry is so desperate to be involved in battle. That was quite a complex sequence to shoot. Obviously, I can't be picked up by Miranda. Not only does she not possess the bicep, but the scale issue comes into play, so we did some stuff on green screen and tried it four or five different ways. It's effective. This was shot down in the South Island. It was quite fun, actually. We had a circuit to do, just galloping around. <laughs> just come past the camera every minute or so and just take 50 riders around in a circle. Look at that lot. Now, where have they come from? <laughs> Amazing piece of organization. That's definitely not CG. <laughs> that was a big day, I remember that. Easily the most awesome battle sequences I've seen up to now. Not even battle sequences, just crowd sequences at this point. You know, they just look, it looks so authentic. Mm. Inside the paths of the dead, we did set stuff, which was obviously kind of reacting to things that weren't there that would be put in later and smoke and effects and cave work. None of this stuff was there when we were shooting this. This was just a huge blue screen. We were just standing there reacting to this voice. There was obviously this, this set, which was, built around this sort of tunnel-like set and a lot of dry ice, green mist, to give the sense of, like, spookiness. Well, of course it's spooky because I'm an actor and I have an imagination. I live in the world of the imagination, so I can spook myself very easily if I choose. You know, actors are like that, really. They kind of, as long as they get some, some slightly kind of, you know, reason behind, however ridiculous and kind of unreal it is. As long as they get that fixed in their heads, they can, they can do anything. The focus points for those sort of wraithy things that are appearing was actually Peter's hand. All right, John, now it's over here now, and uh, just a little will of the wisp, and you're just trying to blow it away. And it just won't go away. Now it's over here, over here, my hand over here, see? And, and now over here. Pete was saying stuff like, okay, there are gonna be hands grabbing you from the ground. There are gonna be things coming up out of the walls and things all over the place. It was like in earlier takes and different things. React, you've gotta to react to these things now, now, now. And it was like all this, it was, it was pure Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson brilliance. Like just do it, you know? See all these skulls here, Dom? Yeah. I stole one of those. Did you? Yeah. Get it in your house now, do you use it as an astro? Uh, I haven't used it as anything yet. They were filming one of these sequences where I was filming something else in another studio next door. I thought, I'll have one of those. Throw it in the back of my car. Did you steal it or did you ask for it? No, I stole it. Oh, Billy, that's... Thousands of them, though. I know, but that's bad. Thousands? Someone will steal something from you sometime. What? Yeah. It will come back to you. Hope it doesn't. I'll return it next time I'm in New Zealand. Return of the Skull. There were a part of it, a blue screen, Particularly where you get where you want the the spectral effect to take place, all it does it means that you have to use your imagination. Uh, actors don't find that difficult at all. It's not it's not a problem. We have an imagination. We live in the world of imagination. So if you stick us in the blue room and say, "Okay, you're in the in a huge cavern, and there are ghosts coming over there. There may be a ghost behind you there." 
We see that. We see what is described when we are being directed. And it's no great craft. It's, we live in the world of the imagination. Everyone who has ever heard a good story being told and has seen the picture of what's happened and has been there, that's just what you have as an actor. He was incredible, Vigo. It was made. Because, I mean, he was endless. You know, I mean, Legolas is just sort of standing back there looking hit with the bow, you know what I mean, making it happen. But Vigo was like dialogue and carrying this moment, carrying so much of these, so many of these moments. You know, I was always there with him. John was, was there as well, unless it was his Brett Beatty, his double, but it was hard work at that point. You know, he was getting thrown sort of chunks of dialogue in the morning. Yeah, we're doing that this afternoon. You know, I mean, this is really, this is big stuff for an actor what he's doing right there. That's really intimidating, sort of, you gotta bring it, sort of acting. And when you get the dialogue the day in the morning before, it can be really intimidating, but that was, it was like, okay, let's go to it, gotta get it, do it. If you don't, well, you don't. What we can get is what we can get. And it was, it was all, they were so fantastic as moments in film. Everyone just wanted to get them. We all just really wanted to make it happen. Wonderful. He grows in confidence and stature throughout the making of these films. It was at that point where we were grabbing things in such a sort of desperate and yet kind of concise way. It was crazy. It was crazy. When I look back now, having had the experience of working on, in film and, and on the films that I've been, had the great fortune to work on since, I just can't believe the genius of Peter and his whole team of people to actually get all that. It's just courage. It's just, it's just really admirable when somebody just says, okay, let's do it, you know, just do it. There's a screen over there, there's a thing there. Guys, go to it. <laughs> you take a look at it and think, Phew. all right, let's get on with it. It's just amazing. At that point in the movie, we'd done so much. There had been so many other sort of trippy things going on and so much other crazy stuff and so much fantastic stuff with scenery and everything else that, I mean, if Pete had told me that Legolas was going to be jump running around naked at that point, I probably would have stripped off and started skipping a jingo. Do you know what I mean? It was like we were all such sort of Jackson followers that he could have said anything and you'd go, yeah, sure. So at this point, Aragorn grabs Legolas and tongues him and you'd have gone, oh, right, yeah, that makes sense. Look at this. This is incredible. They had this big wall of, of synthetic skulls that they'd made. It was like running along a balance beam, but there was a wall to fall back on. You know, you would stand up there and they would pull the, the bag release and you'd be covered by skull upon skull upon skull and have to sort of haul your way out of it. That's crazy. Yeah, that's it. That's all skulls. That was one of the ones I had. Well, that is a lot, isn't it? Told you. I was just walking past, I thought I'll have one of those. Thousands of men. Would be a bad way to die, buried under human skulls. Very few people have gone that way, though. Oh, I was lucky. They built that cave entrance, and it was so real looking, because we were back three foot into that rock face, basically hidden behind that piece of rock that was built to look exactly the same as the rock face on the outside. So you come out through the hill and then you see a sea walk before you. This was one of those really powerful moments where you were inspired by the landscape of New Zealand and looking out over the landscape. And Pete was just like, there are ships burning down there. And I had no idea what he was talking about really. Or what, at that point, what, where we were in the movie, I couldn't figure it out. And I was like, so this is which bit? That was one of the things that was another thing that Pete was so magical about him was like, how did he know all of that? And obviously he knew he had the script and he's a director and he has, you know, all the shots line up and he's got he's got to pick them off. But I mean that that being also my first movie, I was just like, what? There are what? There are ships down there, they're burning, okay, great, okay, fine. And how does that make me feel? That makes me feel, you know, and he'd say, okay, well the, obviously he'd give you a quick, you know, insight into all of it. But it was just like, just react on the moment. The sequence it looked rather easy actually, but it's potentially extremely dangerous because the head is right next to the um, hind hoof and it, the horse, if it's startled in any way, obviously will move in an unpredictable fashion and my head gets totally crushed. And also to pretend to be wounded severely, not move too much when you're actually seeing the hoof come right down next to your eye. So not as easy as it actually looked. 
Yeah, this is the same when I'm, I have to do the movements because it's just like a 40 gallon drum on wheels and I'm getting pushed in. But I've got to do the actual movements like I'm riding a wag. Those were Peter's words and I went, okay, what's a wag? <laughs> and how does a wag move? And then uh, my movements, they took it to digital and then they showed me how they were gonna actually make the wag walk to my movements. And then when I saw it, I was going, oh, wow, wicked, cool. Well, at least I'm, I know how to ride a wag. <laughs> We actually played the character in different scenes. He wanted me to play the character like, you know, funny, you know, make him clumsy, you know, enjoy it, make him really staunch at times, and just played it different ways, which where I'm riding the wag is one time we played it about five different ways. Happy, sad, funny, glad, proud. This is where um, Faramir mortally wounded, is brought back to minister, and Denethor acts as if he had nothing to do with this, feeling terribly sorry for himself, but he's gone terribly bad by now. He needs medicine, my lord. And it's very difficult to, to walk in those costumes, let alone backwards on a lawn. And so what I did while everyone else was having lunch, I went out there and paced it out and, uh, do you know how many steps I had to take in what direction? I think Denethor's a bit overwhelmed by the, the sheer size of this here. The, the size of the Cape Charles knackers? No. <laughs> the size oh, of the opinion. army oh, right. that he's facing here. He thinks it's all over. Yeah. You see Denethor going to self-indulgence now about his line and, you know, he has no leadership qualities left by this turn. And yet he would have been a very good leader, really. By this stage, he's become demented and self-possessed. After he's made this astounding statement, Gandalf has to come and shut him up. As I swung out of this shot, Ian whacked me. I had to turn out of it there and then whack. Each time I saw the film in the cinema, that moment always got a bit of a cheer. Gandalf sconning my father. And Ian decided to do it very firmly and uh, came along with his own approach as to why and how and he did it without any panic. It wasn't like Gandalf was panicking. He was really firm in his leadership. He is more snappy, more direct, and, and that certainly suits the character of Gandalf the White. And he comes back, therefore, as a more focused commander. Um, I see him rather as a samurai in look, rather as anything else. And uh, rather terse, not saying very much. Not telling people why they should do something, but just telling them to get on with it, because there was a job to be done. Yeah, Gandalf's telling them to re return fire. And all of this is all the ruins coming back at us. I'm trying to act staunch in front of all these, all my army, you know, don't be afraid. And yet, I just want them to stand there and just take it. Nice helmet, Bill. Thank you. I had no idea these sequences would look like this. You know, because like in that shot where I'm running with the rest of the soldiers, obviously the other side of the wall, there was nothing, there was a huge blue screen. It was all blue screen and I had to just imagine that this rock was coming towards you. But then later we'd do the scene again, like, like if you freeze frame it, they would have put the rock in place and spit and <laughs> do the rest of the scene. I love how Pete plays around with the idea of a camera floating through space instead of shooting it in the in the way that you would normally think. I think Pete's very aware of the fact that if you're going to try and film a battle scene, lots of things have already been done, so he just keeps trying to push the, the limit a little bit. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. Who knew what a mouse school looked like back in 2001? They were riding horses in 2001. That's what the ringmates were riding. And, OK, you'll be riding a Nazgul. OK, what's a Nazgul? No one knew what anything was. You know, when you read a book, you have your own characters in your head. But when Peter reads a book, <laughs> he's got his characters and, and trying to put them in your head. I'm going, what's a Nazgul? And, and all these images are going through your mind. Oh, it's this beast. Oh, oh, like a dragon. No, well, it's sort of like a dragon, but it's not a dragon. It's got wings. And I went, oh, OK. So I just thought of an ordinary dragon that breathes fire but I was really riding just a dolly. You notice I did get rid of my helmet in that last shot, though? Yeah. It's a lovely helmet. Uh, you know, I feel like it limits me. Performance-wise? Yes. It's a shame. It's gone. All of this stuff, when this was all 
That would be at the top of the wall, all these polystyrene rocks. And they'd drop them off, you know, onto the stuntmen. But at one point they wanted quite big bits. And the stunt guy said, you know, let's let's drop them first, let's see the kind of weight and force that they fall at. And unbelievable that a piece of polystyrene could seem so heavy. Mm. Good job they didn't just drop them, they killed someone. Amazing, I mean, the stunt guys. There was all these different guys with different skills. So you had Stevie, who was a wrestler, who was just quite a little guy, but just so well built. And then some of the other guys, some of them who did Kung Fu, would go over and uh, train in the temples and stuff. Yeah. Just incredible, the skills these guys had. I remember when we did all these sequences, with like the polystyrene dropping and Nazgul coming down, and me pulling off the helmet. And I was saying to Pete, um, you know, where does this actually come? Am I, have I been sent down here by Denethor? Or is this later on? And he said, uh, you know, it's, it's the Nazgul are all attacking. But I was saying, yeah, but have I been up? Have I seen Faramir back? And he's like, ah, I don't actually know. I'm just going to put it in somewhere. <laughs> There's no place for a hobbit! Very near the end of filming all this stuff. Great seeing Gandalf wielding his staff. Yeah, this was actually my very, very last day of filming on everything. What, when you stabbed the guy? Yeah, all this stuff was the very last day, as I'm standing next here. And that was my very last shot. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you're quite pleased with yourself there, aren't you? Well, you know, I feel as though, you know, I don't want to kill anyone. But you've done it. Well, I had to, to save a friend. That's the only reason, really, Tom. We did that all at Stone Street Studios. Totally blue screen all around us. We had to just imagine all of this was happening, like all these rocks are being pelted at us. You're firing at them as well, and they're firing back. You're watching your men, but they can't break the doors to get in. So that's when I give the order to bring Grond in. There's a scene where we're just yelling out Grond, Grond, Grond. And we had to do that for like 10 minutes while the camera just panned through us all. And if you say Grond, 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 and you've got a, you've got a mouth full of fake teeth and a lot of prosthetics on, because you had to open your mouth really, really wide to show your teeth, like the widest you can open your mouth. Your mouth just gets really, really sore. <laughs> we'll see you on this too. I'll just go to the restroom while we're doing that. See you in a bit, Tom. See you. I, I, I won't be long, but you want a coffee or anything? No, I don't drink coffee. Are you all right then? Yeah. Right, I'll be back in a minute. See you. Idiot. That's me.